Edward Bond's Lear premiered under the auspices of the English Stage Company at the Royal Court Theatre on 29 September 1971, directed by William Gaskill, and saw a revival in 1982 by the Royal Shakespeare Company at the other place, with Harry Andrews in the titular role. The thematic essence of Bond's Lear resonated with the turbulent zeitgeist of its era. This period was marked by significant historical upheavals, including the Soviet invasion of Czechoslovakia in 1968, the assassinations of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy, and the turmoil in Israel following the Six-Day War. Concurrently, the Vietnam War intensified, and British troops were deployed to Northern Ireland to suppress unrest related to sovereignty disputes. Political activism among students led to mass demonstrations, some of which escalated into violence. A notable incident in 1970 saw three members of the radical American group, the Weathermen, perish in an explosion while constructing a bomb for terrorist purposes. Lear dramatizes this pervasive violence, portraying all governments and revolutions as inherently brutal and merciless in their disregard for human life. Lear has been hailed as the most violent drama ever staged and remains the most controversial of his works. While it reinterprets Shakespeare's King Lear, the connection to the original play is scarcely discernible. Bond himself has emphasized that his Lear is not an adaptation of Shakespeare's work but rather a critique of it. His objective is to render Shakespeare's play more politically potent, prompting audiences to critically examine their society and themselves, rather than merely providing an uplifting aesthetic experience. As a socially conscious playwright, Bond crafts plays with the intention not merely to entertain but to instigate societal change. Lear boldly reinterprets Shakespeare's King Lear through a lens of critical skepticism and revolutionary fervor. Bond's approach to the classic play is shaped by a rejection of traditional interpretations that he views as sentimental and disconnected from contemporary societal realities. He critiques the academic reverence for King Lear, arguing that it fosters artistic laziness and fails to address Lear's relevance in modern contexts. For Bond, Shakespeare's Lear, a figure from the Renaissance era, needs reimagining to resonate with today's audiences and confront the societal issues of power, violence, and injustice more directly. In Bond's adaptation, the narrative departs from Shakespeare's trajectory, particularly in its treatment of Lear and other characters. Rather than portraying Lear's journey as a purgatorial process of redemption, where he sheds his flaws to reveal fundamental humanity, Bond presents Lear as a figure engulfed in revolutionary violence and societal upheaval. This stark portrayal rejects the romanticized view of Lear's character arc and instead delves into the harsh realities of power struggles and moral decay. Central to Bond's reinterpretation are his characters, like Bodis and Fontenelle, who serve as grotesque parodies of their Shakespearean counterparts. Through them, Bond explores themes of cruelty and absurdity in hierarchical power structures, employing black farce to underscore contemporary cruelties and societal obscurities. His use of alienation effects, such as breaking the fourth wall and employing symbolic acts with stark realism, aims to provoke critical reflection rather than emotional catharsis among audiences. Structurally, Bond's play unfolds across three acts, a mythic beginning, a confrontation with brutal reality, and a resolution that exposes the true nature of societal power dynamics. Each act serves to deepen Bond's critique and thematic exploration. 
moving beyond Shakespearean echoes to offer provocative insights into political and social issues that resonate with contemporary audiences. Thus, Lear exemplifies epic theatre principles by challenging conventional interpretations and confronting audiences with uncomfortable truths about power and violence. Through distortion, alienation, and a sharp critique of societal norms, Bond transforms Shakespeare's tragedy into a powerful commentary on modern injustices. Urging viewers to question their roles in perpetuating societal inequities. His adaptation stands as a testament to the enduring relevance of classic themes when re-examined through a contemporary and critical lens. Act 1 The play Lear commences at the construction site of a wall King Lear is erecting to defend his kingdom from external threats. As the scene unfolds, Two laborious carry the corpse of a dead worker onto the stage, shortly before Lear enters with Lord Warrington and his daughters, Bodice and Fontenelle, among others. Upon noticing the deceased laborer, Lear's primary concern lies with the potential delay in the wall's construction, leading him to execute the worker responsible for the accident. Bodice and Fontenelle object to Lear's violent actions and disclose their intentions to marry Lear's adversaries, the Duke of North and the Duke of Cornwall, respectively. They believe their unions will bring peace, whereas Lear maintains that only the wall can ensure his people's safety. After Lear and his entourage exit, Bodice and Fontenelle reveal their conspiracy with their husbands to launch an assault on Lear's forces. In scene two, as Lear prepares for the impending conflict, Warrington informs him that each daughter has separately written to him, soliciting his betrayal of Lear and subsequently the other sister. Scene three depicts each daughter expressing dissatisfaction with her husband and plotting his demise. In scene four, the audience learns that the sisters' armies have triumphed, yet both Bodice and Fontenelle have failed in their attempts to kill their husbands. Warrington, now a prisoner who has had his tongue cut out, is brought before the sisters. Bodice, knitting calmly, observes as Warrington is tortured by her soldiers. Fontenelle, advocating for increased brutality, deafens Warrington by thrusting Bodice's knitting needles into his ears. Warrington is then taken away by a soldier. Scene 5 finds Lear in the woods, where he discovers and consumes bread lying on the ground. Warrington, crippled and for whom the bread is intended, approaches Lear with a knife but retreats when the gravedigger's boy arrives, offering bread and water to Lear. The boy invites Lear to stay with him and his wife. Scene 6 is set at the boy's house, where Lear learns about the boy's way of life. The boy owns two fields, and his pregnant wife, Cordelia, tends to pigs. When Lear goes out with the boy, Warrington returns with a knife, and the boy's wife alerts them, saying that the wild man has returned. While Lear sleeps, Warrington attacks him with a knife but then departs. In scene 7, the boy laments to Lear about the king responsible for the laborious suffering due to the wall's construction but still invites Lear to stay. A sergeant and three soldiers arrive, searching for Lear. Warrington's body is found blocking the well. The soldiers kill the boy, rape Cordelia, and slaughter the pigs. The carpenter appears and kills the soldiers. Lear is subsequently taken prisoner. Act 2 In the opening scene, Bodice and Fontenelle present Lear before a judge, claiming that he is insane. When questioned about his daughters, Lear denies any familial connection to Bodice and Fontenelle. 
Bodice hands Lear her mirror, believing that the reflection will terrify him. Lear sees himself as a tortured animal trapped in a cage and is consequently declared mad and taken away. Bodice informs Fontenelle of the discontent within the kingdom, forewarning of an impending civil war. Fontenelle reveals that Cordelia is leading the rebels. In scene two, the ghost of the gravedigger's boy visits Lear in his cell. Lear implores the ghost to summon his daughters. The apparitions of Bodice and Fontenelle appear as young girls. Lear converses with them as they rest their heads on his knees. Despite his plea for them to stay, they depart. The ghost reappears and requests to remain with Lear, who consents, suggesting that they will find solace in each other's voices. In scene three, Cordelia arrives with her soldiers, including one who is wounded from a clash with Bodice and Fontenelle's troops. The carpenter joins them. A captured soldier asks to join Cordelia's forces, but she orders his execution due to his lack of hatred. The others leave, abandoning the wounded soldier to die alone. In scene four, Bodice and Fontenelle, at their headquarters, reveal that their husbands have attempted to desert. Bodice presents Fontenelle with Lear's death warrant, which she signs. The Dukes of North and Cornwall are detained and told they will be kept in cells unless needed for public appearances. Alone, Bodice admits she began dismantling the wall but required the workers as soldiers. In scene 5, Cordelia's soldiers, leading Lear and other prisoners, have lost their way. Lear expresses his desire to live only to find and aid the ghost. Fontenelle is also brought in as a prisoner. In scene 6, Lear and the other prisoners, including Fontenelle, are confined in their cell. The ghost, now cold and emaciated, arrives. Lear expresses a wish that he had been the ghost's father and taken care of him. Fontenelle promises Lear protection if he assists her, but at the carpenter's command, a soldier shoots Fontenelle. A prisoner who is a medical doctor arrives to perform an autopsy on Fontenelle. Lear is struck by the beauty of her internal organs, contrasting with her cruelty and hatred in life. Bodice arrives as a prisoner, indicating that Cordelia's forces have overcome the last vestiges of her and Fontenelle's regime. Lear informs Bodice that he was responsible for Fontenelle's destruction. Bodice is also sentenced to death and is stabbed three times with a bayonet by the soldiers. Cordelia, now the carpenter's wife, requests that Lear be spared. Using a scientific device, the doctor removes Lear's eyes. In excruciating pain, Lear exits the prison with the ghost. In scene 7, Lear encounters a family of farmers by the wall. They reveal that the father will work on the wall and the son will become a soldier. Lear, feeling compassion, advises them to flee. He declares that Cordelia is unaware of her actions and vows to write to her about the people's suffering. Act 3 In the first scene, Lear resides in the boy's former house with Thomas, his wife Susan, and John, who all tend to Lear in his blindness. A deserter from Cordelia's wall seeks refuge there, but the ghost urges him to leave for the safety of everyone else. Soldiers arrive searching for the deserter, but Lear conceals him successfully, leading the soldiers to depart empty-handed. The others wish the deserter to leave as well, yet Lear insists that he, and any escapees who come to the house, may remain. 
Scene 2 transpires several months later at the boy's house, where Lear narrates a fable to a group of listeners. Thomas informs the audience that hundreds gather to hear Lear's public addresses, although he fears it is perilous for Lear to continue opposing the government. An officer arrives with Lear's former counsellor, accusing Lear of harbouring deserters. The deserter from scene one is apprehended and led away to be hanged. The counsellor conveys to Lear that Cordelia has so far tolerated his speeches but insists he must cease. After the counsellor and his entourage leave, Lear laments that he remains a prisoner, seeing walls everywhere. The ghost, appearing more emaciated, suggests poisoning the well to drive others away, then taking Lear to a spring for water. As Lear sleeps, John informs Susan of his departure and invites her to join him. John departs, Thomas enters, and a weeping Susan asks Thomas to take her away from Lear. Thomas advises Susan to come into the house. In scene 3, Lear is alone in the woods when the rapidly deteriorating ghost arrives, appearing terrified and believing he is dying. Cordelia and the carpenter enter. Cordelia recounts the soldier's killing of her husband and her rape, and how her new government is forging a better way of life. The ghost, watching his former wife, longs to speak to her. Cordelia pleads with Lear to cease his opposition. Lear insists that Cordelia must dismantle the wall, but she argues that doing so would leave the kingdom vulnerable to enemy attacks. When Lear persists in his defiance, Cordelia threatens to put him on trial and then departs. The ghost is gored to death by pigs that have gone mad. In the final scene, Susan leads Lear to the wall, where he climbs up to dig it out. The farmer's son, now a soldier, shoots Lear, wounding him. Despite this, Lear continues to dig. The farmer's son shoots him again, this time fatally. Lear's body is left alone on stage. The paramount feature of the structure in Bond's plays is its capacity to illustrate the relationship between individuals and their society, emphasizing the nature of the society in which they exist. Bond asserts that this relational understanding is the fundamental issue confronting humanity, failing to resolve it could lead to our destruction. According to Bond, the only suitable structure is that of epic theatre. Interestingly, all playwrights who recognize the significance of social issues have employed this form, a testament to their proper comprehension of contemporary problems. Bond contends that theatre should reinforce the audience's confidence in their ability to transform society. With the problems needing to be handed over to the audience because these problems are perpetually recreated. Unlike Shakespeare, Bond utilizes epic theater in Lear, marking his first venture into this form. Bertolt Brecht, the 20th century playwright, pioneered the modern concept of epic theater for his political dramas. Unlike conventional plays, epic theater unfolds through a sequence of numerous scenes, as seen in Lear, which often spans an extensive time period and involves a large cast of characters. This continuous scene progression aims to prevent the audience from becoming overly emotionally invested in the characters. This deliberate lack of emotional involvement is cultivated through Brecht's alienation effect, which ensures the audience remains aware that they are watching a play, not reality. In Lear, characters periodically address the audience directly, rather than interacting solely with each other, contributing to this effect. When Warrington is tortured, the darkly humorous remarks of Bodice and Fontenelle serve to remind the audience that they are witnessing an exaggerated fiction, removed from reality. 
The purpose of this alienation technique is to compel the audience to engage their intellect rather than their emotions in contemplating the themes and actions of the play. An anachronism refers to an object or element that belongs to a different time period than the one in which it exists, especially something that is strikingly out of place in its context. It is a conspicuous deviation from the environment's temporal continuity. The modern laborious constructing Lear's wall and the futuristic scientific device employed to blind Lear are prime examples of anachronisms. These anachronisms serve two primary purposes. They render the narrative more universal, indicating that its themes and ideas transcend the specific time in which it is set, and they contribute to the alienation effect, creating a surreal atmosphere that underscores the play's unreality. In Lear, anachronism fulfills both these functions. Although Bond's play is a complete narrative in itself, it alludes to William Shakespeare's King Lear. Familiarity with Shakespeare's text enhances the audience's comprehension of Bond's reinterpretation. Bodice's act of knitting during moments of chaos alludes to Charles Dickens's A Tale of Two Cities, where Madame Defarge, a revolutionary, knits a list of aristocrats destined for execution. In Bond's deconstruction of Shakespeare's classic tragedy, Cordelia is not depicted as Lear's youngest and compassionate daughter, but rather as a rural female Castro, in Bond's words. She is a young woman thrust into radical political awareness, driven to action by her rape at the hands of soldiers under Fontenelle and Bodice's command. Consequently, Cordelia leads her own revolutionary army against their regime. The play is set in the year 3100, presumably in ancient Britain, though the incorporation of modern devices suggests the action may be situated in a distant future. The play's action unfolds across various locations. Although Lear's wall is not seen until the final scene, the play begins near it, and it remains a pervasive symbolic presence throughout. Frequent references to the wall evoke a sense of enclosure and claustrophobia, emblematic of the oppression exerted by various regimes throughout the play. The house of the gravedigger's boy is another significant location. In this pastoral setting, Lear encounters the potential for change and the profoundness of human kindness. Bond represents a novel theatrical approach distinct from the realism of the kitchen sink movement. Concerned with the contradictions inherent in a class-based society, Bond illuminates the social, economic, and political factors that shape the consciousness of his protagonists. Bond believes that playwrights have a moral responsibility to their societies. His distinctive use of language is intended to elucidate a complex process, ranging from the naturalistic dialect of his working-class characters to the poetic reflections reminiscent of Shakespeare. The varied discourse types reveal how ideology influences human behavior. Although the plot's development in scenic units follows a Brechtian model, Bond's dramatic style remains highly personal. The interplay of visual poetic images, a logical cause-effect structure, and dialectical relationships involving characters, plot construction, and dramatic movement form the unique attributes of his distinguished dramatic work. As John Russell Brown observes, Bond's plays seek to comprehend contemporary crises and demonstrate potential pathways to a sane society. By exploring the intersection of ideology and the writer's art, Edward Bond's controversial and influential plays offer a profound political and moral critique of human society, paving the way for a radical new theatre of the future.